Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. So this is Emilia Raffo from Chain Security. Um, and today we have a great event for you that we have organized uh, in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Immunify and Chainalysis. And as you can see, you know, from Molly helping us already, we have had ama amazing support from Chainalysis and I want to thank them really uh, quite a lot for, for, you know, their support and, you know, uh, using the software and the promotion and, and all of that. So thanks a lot to, to Molly, the star behind the, <laughs> behind the, the stage there. Um, so today we're going to be talking about basically the anatomy of a DeFi hack. We're going to be talking about how to build a total defense system, um, you know, from how to prevent a hack from happening with the intervention from Nico, uh, Nico Schaffer, my colleague, uh, who's a senior uh, blockchain security engineer at Chain Security. And then we're going to move to Immunify. Immunify, um, uh, I don't know why the slides are, oh yeah, perfect. And then Immunify, uh, it's going to be Duncan Townsend, the CTO of Immunify, who's going to be explaining and going into a bit more detail. So for the more technical audiences, you're going to be very satisfied with Duncan's presentation. Um, for the less technical, don't hesitate to ask your questions. I think, you know, uh, most of us are less technical than Duncan, so don't hesitate to ask your questions and uh, we'll be happy to answer them or to cover things differently if, uh, if you prefer. Um, and then after Duncan, who's going to be talking about the bug bounties and how to react as a hack is happening, then uh, we're going to have a chain analysis, Patrick Drummond, who's an investigator at chain analysis. And then we're going to look at how you can actually track the money that has been stolen or not really stolen, you know, uh, just uh, exploited, let's say, uh, and how you can track the funds. So this is our anatomy of a hack today, before, during, after. Um, so now the first speaker is from Chain Security. So maybe I give you a very small uh, intro on who we are at Chain Security. So, you know, as it's written there, uh, we try to build trust in the blockchain ecosystem and make it secure for corporations, governments, and startups. Uh, so now our, you know, our, our biggest uh, um, uh, business at the moment is the smart contract audits, but we also work with larger organizations uh, trying to figure out how they can use blockchain in a secure way that can, uh, you know, help them um, uh, achieve their goals. Um, if you can put the next slide, Nico. Thank you very much. Uh, so typically, you know, we do reports for, you know, big players such as MakerDAO, uh, such as Curve. But, uh, sorry, can you, <laughs> sorry, can you put the next and the next? Yeah, perfect. Um, we work a lot on Ethereum and typically we've also uncovered, you know, vulnerabilities on Ethereum itself. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is, again, an example of our clients. Um, so this is it for the presentation of Chain Security. I said it was going to be short. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you want to ask anything. We are happy to, you know, happy to discuss how we can, how we can help. And without further ado, let me give the floor to Nico Schaeffer, who's going to explain to you how you can avoid hacks in the first place. Nico, do you want to put your webcam? Yes, I think hey, my... Hi, Nico. Hey, um, I hope you all still see the slides too. So thank you very I much, Emily. The Sorry, yeah, there you go. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you very much, Emily, for the introduction. Uh, as Emily told you, I will start with basically smart contract audits as the, let's say, first line of defense. Well, there is basically one line before, that's your development already, your testing, DevOps and all that. Um, but if your code is basically fully developed and you think it's ready to be audited, then we are the first line. We are trying to find any remaining bugs, vulnerabilities, inefficiencies. And as Emily already told you, the end product you will receive is this report, which you can then also share with the community. And further on, the second and third line, I'm super happy. This, this event is pretty cool in my opinion that we have this different setups and how to react on any issues. So um, let me start uh, why we sh actually, why should we secure the smart contracts at all? Um, it always, I mean, securing a smart contract is kind of always a trade-off between what do I want to protect? What's the value I want to protect? How much effort do I want to put into securing 
something. In the end, nothing will be 100% secure. There will be always a remaining uh, risk. So the question is how much effort do I want to put into my security? And um, well, regarding smart contracts, they usually directly deal with money. So that's already a big incentive in for, for most projects to protect their smart contracts. Um, and the amount actually is significant. So um, if you saw what, how the DeFi space evolved, it's getting more and more that's put in there and the whole space is still in the infancy. So um, it's still not a super developed space. And therefore I think um, it's really important that watch out where you invest your money and that you have these projects well as secure as possible. Nothing will be secure uh, completely. And what's also special in the DeFi space is, I mean, we know it from the traditional finance space where we have banks who have systematic risk uh, in this space, in the DeFi space, there are definitely projects which have significant systematic risk because the system, the DeFi space is heavily connected and I just call it, it's prone to a domino effect, meaning if there are some projects with big issues, uh, this will cause a domino effect, maybe tearing down big parts of the system. So be careful there. And um, we also had a publication um, back when we were part of PwC, where we listed uh, a little bit what was hacked or stolen in 2020. So uh, that's what you see on the right side where you see some, some of the projects, which might even pop up in the other slides then where we talk about um, how funds were traced or how they reacted on hacks. Um, I quickly want to give an overview over um, my work and what I see as the most common issues um, when I read through smart contracts and also when we then see the hacks. Um, Definitely one thing, uh, which, sorry for that, um, I actually rephrased in the other slide. It's not really the flash loans, it's it's more the manipulation of oracles, It's which is the issue in the end, um, which also was the attack vector for multiple hacks. Um, then famous, I mean, that's one, one of the famous hacks ever, the re-entrancy hacks. Uh, maybe some examples. I think uh, don't nail me down down on that. It's it's more up from my head that there was I think flash loan attacks on Balancer. Um, then there was BCX. I think Harvest Finance reentrances. I mean the DAO hack, uh, Landf, Landf E or whatever. There were multiple. Um, they are also on the slide here. Um, and this was significant amounts that were basically hacked or on stake there um, some of them could be rescued that's also something cool we will talk about um, then <laughs> something that actually ha happens a lot um, where people might think they need to reinvent the wheel and uh, we have flawed upgrade schemes Keep i'm sorry up. nico can, I, can yes. I just interrupt you for one second so i'm i mean i'm not super technical can you explain a bit more, you know, kind of what, what's a flash loan, how that works, what's, what's a re-entrancy attack, basically, like on a very simple level, just so that we can understand a bit better? Yes, yes, yes. So um, basically, a flash loan, let me skip some slides now. Um, the idea of flash loan here is that you take a loan. So the flash loans are pretty special um, in the DeFi world because you basically can only have that in the DeFi world. It's not something you can have in traditional finance because what you can do is you do something in one transaction. So you lend money and you pay it back in one transaction. As this transaction is atomic, you basically only get the money if you also are basically pay it back because there will be a check and the whole transaction is not executed if you don't pay it back. So that's pretty special. And as there is no counterparty risk, because if I lend money out, I know that I'm getting it back. Um, I can actually lend out a lot of money to anyone because I don't really care. I know I get back the money. I know I get back the interest. So take as much as you want. So that's basically a flash loan. Um, Emily, I hope this uh, was comprehensive. 
Um, if not, feel free everyone to ask questions there. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, re-entrances is basically um, when you re-enter a system, meaning you calling a function and there's a possibility to somehow call this function again, or it might even be a not the function, it might be a re-entrancy into the system somewhere else. Um, for both, I basically will will have some some more examples. Um, then flawed upgrade schemes is basically that's where people always think like you have a smart contract that's in stone that you don't change it that's immutable. That's not the case. So depending on the smart setup of the smart contracts, it's upgradable. Um, a little bit more, you have some more restrictions to usual upgradable software, but in, in the end, it's upgradable. And um, that means that you need to be really careful if you upgrade such sensitive systems. And if you have a mistake there, this can really screw the whole system because some things are immutable more or less, and um, this then leads to issues. Then do not often, so DOS, sorry for basically taking the abbreviation there. It's the denial of service, um, which, is something that can be done if a contract is, has some flaws pretty easily. Um, and that's one thing where it's not really a hack, but you're blocking a system. Um, unsupported token properties is also something we see a lot. Uh, you might know, most of you know the ERC20 standard, which is a standard which was agreed on that tokens support different features. Uh, these features are pretty basic. So people add features, there are other standards and whatsoever. And um, token can have really weird behavior. Unfortunately, I didn't put this in because it just popped into my mind. There's an awesome list uh, in the internet. If you Google something like weird tokens, uh, there's a list where the tokens are described with their weird behavior, which is really interesting because some tokens just don't behave as expected. And that might cause issues because you implicitly assume that a token behaves correctly to the standard, but sometimes doesn't. And I put this in, in brackets. <laughs> it's just a big thing, uh, which was also in our publication. Uh, rug pulls, <laughs> that's something we cannot protect you uh, from, actually. Um, at least we try to, by having KYC processes on our clients, so I will come to this uh, later, um, but be careful in what you invest. I just wanted to list this there. Always watch out uh, and see if you think these projects are legit, um, even though they might have an audit, uh, still might be possible that there's some way to get away with all your money. Um, if you want a more uh, elaborate list on the weaknesses, there is the website I linked, the awcregistry.io where there's uh, a lot of um, issues described with examples in detail. Unfortunately, a little bit technical, but if you Google on the issues, you will also find uh, some information that maybe has uh, a good intro and is not super technical. Um, let me now get to some examples because this was a little bit high level maybe. So let's go into an example. I already had this slide. Um, Emily was asking for it. So um, it's about Oracle manipulation. We have seen this a lot. It's something connected to flash loans, but not exclusively. So basically any whale could have done this. And that's also not something which is super unique to the DeFi space. It's just the combination with the flash loans, which are unique to the DeFi space. So in the end, what's happening is you have an exchange which provides a price feed um, to some projects and you manipulate the price feed. You manipulate the price information, something in traditional finance that is also done where basically you try to, for example, push the value of a stock, manipulate the value of a stock into one direction while being leveraged in a position uh, on this underlying and then participate more on this as you lose on manipulating. The same idea is carried over to DeFi with this unique feature of a flash loan. So you basically manipulate 
Can Oracle Feed uh, benefit from this over or undervalued price information? And the components in DeFi uh, usually is uh, some exchange like Uniswap, um, Curve, whatsoever. And um, then you need enough volume to influence the price, to influence the, the exchange price and manipulate it in the direction you want to have it. And this volume is usually um, generated by getting a flash loan. So um, that's the unique stuff in the DeFi space that basically more or less everybody has the ability to, to move huge amounts of money and do this manipulation. I already uh, talked about the flash loan, so I will not repeat that one. Uh, what a flash loan is, we introduced that. And then there's, uh, I don't know, I just, uh, sketched the idea of it. So basically you go in there, manipulate the Oracle, um, and there will be the, the other DeFi contract querying this price information. For example, I had this here. The, the example is uh, I put some coins into a DeFi project and this DeFi project evaluates what these coins are worth by querying the price information for these coins from the Oracle. So what I do is I manipulate the Oracle, push up the price of these coins or these tokens at the exchange. And um, the DeFi project thinks, oh, what? I'm putting in like a lot of money in there. Might be some, I don't know what to call it, whatever, some bullshit coins. And um, then this price is overvalued by the DeFi contract and I get um, a share of the whole pool because uh, there are others who also put in these coins or tokens and I get more of the shares than I'm supposed to get. So um, in the end, that's the idea. I also then reverse my manipulation and I can basically craft all this into one transaction. So it's atomic, it's, it's really quick and uh, I'll just cheat it there. Um, there are ways to protect for this. Uh, and we usually check the projects we are auditing that they protect for this. Um, for example, you could query not like the spot price, but query uh, a time frame and use the average. Um, so it's harder to cheat on that. Uh, you could also reuse different oracles and accumulate the price. There are different ways to, to protect for this. So, um, but this was something seen in DeFi a lot. Uh, and I presented the high level idea. I want to also show you some example where we see some code and this goes into the direction um, i basically did what i told you now i deposited some tokens into a project i received my share of the project so this is the deposit function oh sorry um, the deposit function uh, on the top there uh, i the, the, this i just um, commented out everything there it doesn't matter what's happening there just think about there's even re-entrancy lock or whatsoever. And I received some, some shares and for, for the token I put into the project, project. And there's one thing we need to assume. There is a re-entrancy lock. You see it's different from these here. So this deposit function is just in a different contract like the withdraw function. They are in different contracts for whatever reason. It might be the setup here. And then we have the withdraw function. Um, so what the re-entrancy lock, sorry, what the re-entrancy lock does, it just protects that I'm not re-entering exactly this function so that I'm not withdrawing, uh, basically going to the restore function or the deposit function and in the same call. Um, but as I said, they're different, uh, they're in different contracts. So this will be one important point there to, to mention. Um, and then we see that someone, they basically check the amount is bigger than zero and then they calculate the percentage uh, which I receive from the total supply, from the shares. So let's say I had 50% of the shares and the other 50% belong to Emily. So I get now 50% of the shares. Uh, I'll pay it back with a withdraw. I give back my shares. I want 50% of the tokens that are locked in this pool. And let's say there are two different tokens locked. Um, so in the next line we see I'm burning my shares and um, then I get the underlines. Let's say there are two underlying tokens and um, there's a loop looping over these two underlines and um, basically just 50% uh, of these underlines 
are sent to me. Looks all fine there, re-entrancy logs, everything looks cool. Uh, there's an issue, and the issue is a little bit hidden. Um, it depends on how this, here's a different contract called, how this uh, contract basically behaves and how this function is uh, implemented. Because as we said, there might be tokens that behave a little bit differently than expected. And if they offer the opportunity to do something like calling or hooking into with other code, um, here, for example, it might be possible that I, because deposit and withdraw are in two different contracts with different reentrancy locks, meaning they also have different state variables that are locking this functions. What I can do here is I could, it might be possible for me to call from here into deposit again, screw up um, basically the percent, the, the token amounts in the pool. And as here, the token balance of address this is calculated, I would receive different percentages. I, I mean, I would receive, receive still 50%, but the token pool would have different balances. Uh, the system would have trouble here. Um, that's kind of a real world example we found. Um, and this is easy to fix. Uh, they just need to separate the stuff and um, calculate the percentage in, and for each token and then withdraw the tokens. So this was a real world example, which was the deep dive where we saw a little code. This was the high level example. Um, and I need to check. Um, okay, I'm perfectly in time, I think. Um, then let me talk a little bit about the process, how we would audit a project. Um, given you want to get an, have, want to have an audit, you basically contact Emily. So feel free to contact Emily um, and she will collect all the necessary information. You provide your code base and we estimate the project. You will get in our onboarding and KYC process, which was mentioned before, we, where we try to filter the projects that we have high quality projects. And um, after signing the contract, we start with the code audit uh, and aim for an intermediate report. So we will write up all the issues we found, send you this intermediate report and you can fix the issues and we will review the fixes. There might be some iteration because fixes might sometimes introduce new bugs and we will write the final report. Then, yeah, the audit itself is part like partly tool supported. Mainly it's a manual audit where we have experienced auditors who have seen a lot and to try to find all the issues in the code. Um, then this is my last slide because that's also the bridge over now to the next part. Uh, the limits. We always do our audit based on best effort. So there was like maybe one small story. There was really someone calling us and was like, hey, but that doesn't make sense if we cannot sue you. We want someone who has lots of assets that we can then sue uh, and take from the company if you if you basically make a mistake. That's not how it works. Um, we are doing this on best effort. We really try to help our clients, um, but we don't. Uh, we are not liable. Uh, because that's also one, in my opinion, the, the most reasonable answer on that. Uh, first, we cannot foresee the future, uh, meaning there might be a project that is safe in the point of time we audited, but with upcoming new ideas, new projects, it might get unsecured. Uh, the, the other thing is um, we are also not almighty and we all make mistakes. So if we do that, I'm handing over now. Um, let me say thank you here and if you have questions feel free to post your questions thanks and thanks a lot, Nico. it was super interesting and actually we already have a question um so are there any best practices that need to be followed for the development life cycle of DeFi smart contracts and protocol so any best practices that need to be followed uh, yes i mean they're, they're basically the best practices that you should follow if you develop any software. So uh, the, the most important part of everything, in my opinion, is testing, testing, testing. So really get good testing, good coverage. Um, also uh, basically test it in, in the most realistic environment as possible. Don't mock up too much. Um, and else I think uh, usual 
usual software development practice apply on, on this. There are also, um, for developing their amazing tools, their amazing software packages and frameworks, um, depending on what you are familiar with, might be you like Python more, then go for something like, uh, like Brownie. Uh, if you like um, JavaScript more, go for something like Truffle or Hardhat. Uh, so they're amazing frameworks also. I hope this answers the question. If not, feel free to elaborate. Thank you. So I don't. Thank you. See other questions. Um, so guys, if you have any more questions afterwards, don't hesitate. You know, just write that it's a it's a question for Nico or for Duncan or for Patrick. Uh, don't don't hesitate to ask even later. Nico, thanks so much for this explanation. Uh, I feel like I even you know I being in the in the company, I feel like I understand more thanks to you. So <laughs> thanks a lot for that. Um, so now we're gonna have our next presentation from Duncan, the CT Unify. Um, so this is going to be very interesting because Immunify, um, so not only do they do bug bounties and they're one of the biggest or maybe the biggest bug bounty provider for, for DeFi, um, but also they have something called a war room. And this is so exciting. As soon as I heard about that, I wanted them to be in this event because it's basically the first response, you know, the emergency responders when you realize that there is a vulnerability or that there is an exploit. So Duncan, I'm going to give you the floor. Is there any way you can put your, your webcam or are we just going to be hearing you? I think you're just going to hear me. The um, <clears throat> the software I'm using is not really playing nice with my webcam. Sorry. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Duncan. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you, Nico, for that uh, overview of your first line of defense. Um, let me say bug bounties are your last line of defense. Um, I'll also talk a bit about uh, my, my own role. So at CTO of Immunify, my role consists of evaluating a lot of bug reports, um, doing these war rooms, this crisis management, um, of course, doing some little smart contract development myself and looking for bugs in our client's code. Um, so we're going to do sort of a broad overview of what you should do um, to make it so that if you do have a vulnerability, if your auditor mix, misses it, if your bug bounty program misses it, um, what next? Um, so next slide, please. Preparedness is super important here. You do not want to have to ask the question, well, now what? You want to have a playbook ready for all of these different scenarios. You know, who do you talk to? You know, uh, do you have uh, an auditor or a war room on, on retainer that you can pull in uh, to give you technical advice? Do you have a PR firm that you can pull in to do community management? Um, you know, if you have a team member who has been severe fish or kidnapped, you know, do you have a physical security expert? Do you have uh, key man insurance uh, to resolve that situation? <clears throat> you know, if, uh, if there's a market collapse, I mean, you know, uh, Ethereum is down, what, 8% today? Um, you know, if that goes down further, do your smart contracts still work? Um, there was a uh, Iron Finance had a problem with their stablecoin where the value of their collateral collapse, which caused a cascade, which actually locked the entire contract. You have to consider those sorts of things and build a playbook so that, you know, when bad things happen, you don't get caught out saying, hmm, well, this is bad, but I don't know what to do next. Um, Immunify can help you with that. We do provide a service where we uh, walk you through building that sort of playbook. We don't do smart contract auditing. We, we can't help you with, you know, what happens if my smart contract uh, has a bug, but we can help you with, you know, what happens if um, my keys are leaked or something like that. Next slide, please. In the event of a crisis like this, your general procedure is as follows. Any funds that you can rescue, you pull them. Any contracts that are possible, you pause them. You want to then immediately alert your users, giving them a reasonable level of detail. What funds were lost? What funds are still at risk? What funds are safe? Will they get their money back? Um, do we know, you know briefly what happened? What kind of vulnerability is it? We have found that even in crisis situations like this, projects are generally rewarded by their communities for that clarity of communication. Now, of course, right, you want to make everyone's funds safe. But 
no one is served by pretending that funds aren't safe if they are in fact not safe. Communicating on social media, very important. You don't want it to just be on your DAP. You want it to be on social media so that the news gets out, so that if you know there's a user who hasn't used your platform in a week or so, they get that information. And then, of course, you want to write a postmortem. This is for um, building that confidence, really showing that you understood uh, what happened, you took that as a lesson, and you're going to rebuild better and stronger. Next slide, please. Communicate early, communicate often, communicate the truth, and give clear instructions here. The clarity of those instructions is super important. And particularly for non-expert users, you might want to integrate that into your DAP, into your decentralized application, whatever website you have that users use to interact with your smart contract. That means if they need to, you know, for instance, revoke an approval or pull funds out of a vulnerable contract, there needs to be a big banner on your site that says, click this button to make yourself safe. Um, early and often, I recommend that you make your first public statement about any sort of vulnerability, you know, whether it was exploited, whether it was saved, within about half an hour of you taking any action. That really cuts off a lot of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt about what's going on with your smart contracts. Users will notice if you've paused your smart contracts, and if you don't make a public statement, people start talking, oh, are they running? And that's really the, the, um, the rumor that you want to head off. It's not a rug pull. Your funds are safe. You know, your funds will be returned to you within 72 hours. Something like that. And then, of course, if you lie to your users, you will never rebuild that trust. You need to tell the whole truth according to your best knowledge right now. Next slide, please. Your technical response. So once you've managed the PR, or concurrently with managing the PR, you want to mount a technical response. If there are still funds in your contract, what can be done to return them to their users? If you are going to continue operating your protocol, for those users who lost their collateral, lost some assets, how can you create a claims process? Can you issue IOUs? Can you make your users whole using the proceeds of your, uh, of your protocol? If you have possible contracts, pause them. I'm going to say this again, but the thing that will save you more often than anything else is having plausible contracts. When a vulnerability is found, if you can pause your contracts and stop the vulnerability from being exploited, your users will thank you, your uh, response team will thank you, and you will thank your past self. Um, and then, of course, if all else fails, you have to hack the contract yourself. And this is one of the more harrowing things to have to go through because there are so many things that can go wrong, right? You want to make sure that you um, test it extensively uh, in a private in a local blockchain fork. Um, you want to make sure that you make use of private mempools. You want to make sure that you can't get front run. You want to make sure that nobody else finds this vulnerability until you've made it safe. Um, and this is something that Immunify does. Uh, we have a consortium of white hat hackers, auditing agencies, um, the works who are uh, ready to spring into action to help you save your, uh, your users' funds. Um, and we have, of course, more, more specific technical advice we can give, but that's not really the topic of this presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, so I, I briefly touched on this. Um, in the previous slide, you want to make sure that the exploit can't be, or the vulnerability can't be exploited by anyone else. So that means changing the contract, breaking the contract, or please, please, please make your contracts plausible so that you can pause your contract. Uh, anything that can go wrong, make it plausible. Um, in the past, uh, we've had issues where contracts were not plausible and were still vulnerable and had significant exposure of user funds. And uh, that was a, was a pretty significant vulnerability. Um, once you've done as much as you can to prevent anyone else from hacking it, you want to deploy your specialized white hat contract. So the important thing here is that this contract should not be runnable by anybody else, and as much of the parameters as possible should be hard-coded to avoid generalized front-running bots. There are bots who are monitoring the mempools of um, blockchains, not, not just Ethereum, but also you know, BFC, XI, RSK. Um, and if they see a uh, transaction that can be um, rerun by them, just by, change, just by tweaking a couple parameters, 
they will submit that transaction with a higher gas fee and run your own hack contract themselves and hack and uh, steal all of your money. Now, some of these guys are nice guys. They're white hats. They give you the money back. But you really don't want to be relying on the, uh, the generosity of strangers for this sort of thing. And then, of course, you want to use a private mempool. The, you know, the big one being uh, Tai Chi. And then, of course, um, Flashbot, which is a service that is frequently used for market manipulation, can actually be used to prevent market manipulation and front running if you configure it correctly. Next slide, please. Lastly, once you've hacked your own contract, you need to return the funds to your users. You want to deploy a claims contract. If the vulnerability is still out there and is possible to be re-exploited, you want that claims contract to check that the user has made themselves safe before it returns the funds to them. If you're going to do a uh, essentially a direct airdrop back to your users, make sure you snapshot the chain state right before you deploy your white hat hack. If you're you should publicly post how much of each asset you're going to be returning to each user so that users can be assured that they are in fact getting their money back and that they are getting the correct amount of money back. And then for, uh, for usability, deploy a Web3 UI for claims. Integrate this into your main DAP. Uh, make it easy for your users to get their money back. That's of course if you're not going to send it back to them directly. If that of course depends on the particulars of the vulnerability itself. Next slide, please. When you get a bug report, not necessarily a hack, but a bug report that your contracts are vulnerable. This is, of course, you know, the best case scenario. If you have a bug bounty program, you're in heavily incentivizing white hats to look at your contract. You make this outcome more likely as compared to the bad outcome of having to respond to a black hat hack. In Unify, this is our core business. This is, we do a lot of this for you. Validation. Uh, you want to make sure that the report is real, that there are funds at risk, and that it warrants a response. Communicate. You need to tell the white hat hacker you believe them, that you appreciate their help, and that you know if they can continue to help you further, you'll make it worth their while. Pause the contracts. Please, please, please make your contracts pausable so that you can pause your contracts so that you don't have to white hat hack, or that if you do have to white hat hack, it's a lot less of a nail biter. Collaborate with your security team on a fix. That's going to be your developers. That's going to be um, a war room service like Immunify. That's going to be the white hat hacker who reported the bug. And if you have uh, any auditing agencies who are willing to work with you on short notice, loop them in as well. Validate the fix. So if your contracts are pausable and funds are locked but still at risk before you actually deploy your white hat hack, you want to farm it out for review. That means getting auditors involved, getting your community involved. It means posting a special bug bounty. We've had projects post a special, you know, if you can break our fix, you know, we'll pay you $50,000. Those work great for making sure that your fix isn't going to break anything or isn't going to get uh, abused by generalized front runners. And then, of course, lastly, you want to deploy that fix and keep your community informed. The more you can do to keep the community looped in at every step here, the more your community is going to reward you for being honest and forthright with what's going on. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pause here before we get into some of the deep technical details of um, some bugs that were reported through Immunify uh, for questions about what to do bef just before and during a hack event. We don't have any questions? Uh, no, 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 no questions. Okay, great. So I'm going to go through a couple bugs that were surfaced through Immunify that were fixed with no impact to user funds, and the protocols continue as if nothing had ever happened. Um, I want to emphasize here that each of the projects that I'm listing here, each of the protocols I'm listing here, perform totally admirably throughout this whole process. And yes, they had a bug, but the fact that they fixed that bug responsibly and have disclosed it speaks volumes to their commitment to security. I would feel completely comfortable entrusting my money to any one of these projects. Please do not interpret their being listed here as a black mark. It is, it is a kudos that they responded the way they did. So let's talk about charged particles. Um, they're an NFT marketplace. Uh, you can mint NFTs with interest-bearing assets, 
And then, of course, uh, you can wrap NFTs and you can create NFTs where every time they're sold, it pays the creator um, a commission on the sale price. Next slide, please. Charge Particles has a vulnerability here that allows users, or sorry, that allows creators to uh, extract a ransom from NFT holders. Um, the vulnerability is in this contract here by Proton, Proton being the name of a interest-bearing NFT under the Charge Particles system. Um, by, uh, by deploying a malicious NFT with a uh, particular construction here, the sale of the NFT can be held for ransom uh, until the creator uh, is paid. Uh, next slide, please. The vulnerability is right here. The royalties receiver contract is set by the NFT creator, not necessarily the current owner. And because when that NFT is transferred, when it was when it's sold through this NFT marketplace, the um, Royalties receiver, which is the creator of the NFT, is paid a commission. This contract, the royalties receiver, can revert. So this send value here, um, when you send Ether to a recipient contract, that contract gets to run code. And if that code reverts, the whole transaction can revert. Um, and in doing so, you can denial of service the sale of that NFT until you receive your ransom. Uh, next slide, please. And here's uh, a simple example of that, how you would ransom an NFT. Uh, you, this contract would be set as the um, receiver. And all this does is revert if the ransom is not paid. And then once you pay the ransom of one Ether, it lets you uh, transfer the NFT as if nothing had ever happened. So it's totally permissionless. And of course, you can know that once the ransom is paid, the NFT will in fact be unlocked, which is you know a crucial part in any sort of ransom deal. Next slide, please. As far as development practices that you can adopt to avoid vulnerabilities like this, anything that's not uh, validated by governance or supplied by a contract owner should be treated with hostility. Um, there's all sorts of vulnerabilities that you can get involved with here. Um, so, uh, like Nico. I uh, mentioned you can have uh, re-entrancy uh, by calling other contracts or by calling back to the contract yourself. Um, you can have denial of service by reverting, or you can consume unbounded amounts of gas and do gas briefing. Um, I should actually, me mentioning uh, Nico's list of vulnerabilities, uh, I think the, the list was flash loans, re-entrancy, flawed upgrades, denial of service, and badly behaved ERC-20 tokens. Immunify has seen an instance of it at least one of each of those in the last weeks. So these are all real vulnerabilities that are affecting live deployed contracts. Um, take that seriously. Make sure you get your contracts audited. Make sure you list the bug bounty. Make sure that you're prepared. You have a response plan uh, if your contracts are vulnerable to one of those. The last piece of advice here is so you always use a pull pattern for payment. So essentially that means that if you're ever going to send money uh, you only ever send money to your caller. You never send it to a third party. Uh, Immunify uh, has a Medium blog where we post postmortems on all of our bug disclosures. Um, I can tell you that we have a whole ton of bugs that are awaiting disclosure that are still in our pipeline that we will do right up here. So uh, stay tuned for more if that is the sort of thing you're interested in. Uh, do I have time for one more of these? Please go ahead. It's so interesting. All right, we'll do one more. Um, so this is a vulnerability in PancakeSwap, which is the largest swap platform on uh, BSC, Binance Smart Chain. Uh, in addition to being a swap platform, uh, PancakeSwap has a bunch of periphery contracts that uh, provide useful services to the community, including a lottery or prediction market, yield farming, that sort of thing. This concerns the lottery. So the lottery happens in phases. You buy, so first the lottery is open and you can buy tickets then the lottery is closed, then the drawing happens, a winner is selected, and, and then the whole process repeats. And of course, anyone who has purchased a winning lottery ticket can claim their winnings at any time. And the winning lottery ticket is represented by an NFT. The on-chain sources of randomness are combined with an 
off-chain random number, and that draws the winning lottery number. Um, there's actually a vulnerability there, which if you're extremely clever, you'll have noticed. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. So here's the vulnerable contract. Now, this is a bit of an unfair example because the vulnerability here is rather is not what's in the contract, but rather what's been left out. Um, this contract, or sorry, this method um, is what lets you mint uh, a, con a lottery NFT. Um, you supply a bunch of n numbers that you would like to purchase. You specify the price per number. It computes how much to remove for you, mints you the relevant NFTs, and you proceed on with your life. Um, there's not on its face anything wrong with this contract, but if we go to the next slide, we'll see what was left out. The problem is that you can buy a ticket during the drawing phase. Now, what's the vulnerability there? Once the drawing transaction enters the memory pool, the winning number becomes predictable. You can examine that transaction, execute it uh, using your own local node, discover what the winning lottery numbers are, and then go out and buy that number before the transaction is confirmed. In doing so, you can be guaranteed to win every single time, and you can, of course, drain the lottery for all it's worth by buying a ton of winning lottery tickets. The fix here, of course, is simply to add this line back in. Next slide, please. This is a copy-paste error. So as the name of the previous method suggests, multi-buy, there is, in fact, a single-buy method, which is not vulnerable. Um, when the code was copied from the single-buy to the multi-buy, that requirement wasn't carried along with it. And so um, the, uh, the multi-buy method was vulnerable. The multi-buy uh, method also wasn't exposed through the Web3 UI at the time the vulnerability uh, was discovered. And unit testing didn't cover the sad path there. It didn't cover, uh, it didn't go through and make sure it hit every single revert statement. So make sure that when you're testing, you test not only that the contract works as you expect, but also that it doesn't work as you don't expect. Um, that means you need to make sure that you hit every single require statement in your code. And a good coverage tool will let you know when you have, uh, when you've missed on that. And once again, if you would like more detail here, there's a full write-up on our medium. Next slide, please. Uh, my last example, and I'll try to blaze through this as quick as possible because I know that we are a little bit low on time. This is ZapperFi. They're a portfolio management platform. They uh, let you move your funds around between various uh, yield generating strategies in DeFi. The particular contract that we're dealing with um, lets you do easy management of Uniswap V2 LP positions. The Uniswap Automated Market Maker, of course, pays yield to its stakers as the pools are used, as trades are made, the, uh, the swap fee goes to the LP stakers. Um, and in this case, the contract is used to quickly withdraw liquidity, li uh, or withdraw LP tokens, liquidate the position, and move to a different LP pool uh, if that pool is generating better yields. There's an EIP proposal, um, 2612, which lets users um, authorize the transfer of tokens without submitting a transaction on chain it's rather clever and the, the vulnerability here is that the uh, interface with that uh, so-called permit api of the uniswap uh, contract was not implemented correctly so if we go to the next slide we'll take a look at that so zap out with permit basically lets you remove your LP tokens or your liquidity from the Uniswap LP pool. Um, and this extra argument, the permit data, is supposed to be the, um, the signature that authorizes the Zapper contract to withdraw your LP token. The problem here is that there's no validation that's performed. So if we go to the next slide. What's in red here is the vulnerability. The pool address, we just invoke the very low level dot call on it. And in doing so, we can call any method whatsoever. So if a user has set an approval for the Zapper contract, what can now happen is an attacker can call into the Zapper contract and say, that victim user, why don't you just give me all of their money? And the Zapper contract will happily comply. 
So next slide, please. The takeaway here is don't use dot call. It's extremely dangerous. If you're going to use it, make sure you know what you're doing. Um, you should not take arbitrary opaque call data. You should always take structured data and turn it into that call data um, on chain. This is uh, a less error prone way of attempting to sanitize. If you have to take arbitrary call data, make sure that you, you apply some really robust whitelisting. You need to whitelist those selectors. You need to whitelist uh, which methods can be called. You should whitelist which contracts can be called. And if possible, you should destructure that call data and apply some constraints to it. Uh, and of course, a linter or static analyzer, or in fact, SolC, the compiler itself, will complain to you if you're using low-level call. Um, so try to avoid it. And then once again, there's a medium write-up if you are interested. And uh, that concludes what I had prepared for you guys here today. I will pause again for questions. Thank you so, so much, Duncan. It was really, I mean, so much, so much content that is really, you know, um, applicable, that is graphic, that, you know, I think it's really, I mean, I learned a lot and really, I'm really thankful for that. Um, so I think, so I don't have questions there, but I think one question that could be interesting uh, would be the one that was asked to Nico. Uh, what are, in your opinion, the best practices when developing those protocols? If I understood, you think smart contracts smart contracts should be possible. That's that's what I that's what I'm gonna remember. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something else? So what are the best practices? Yeah. So possibility is just an acknowledgement um, that you yourself may write a bug and that it may become necessary to mitigate it on chain. You know, of course, we hope that that doesn't happen, but your war room will thank you if your contracts are possible. Uh, as far as best practices, um, use a static analyzer, use a linter. So that would be something like SolHint and uh, something like um, uh, uh, Slither as a static analyzer. Um, those are sort of your, your base level of uh, here are things you should think about not doing. Uh, unit test coverage, as Nico said, super, super important, but uh, for next level testing, I recommend the use of a property-based fuzzer. Uh, define the invariance of your contract, let the fuzzer run on it for hours to days to weeks. See if your fuzzer can find a way to break the invariance of your system. Uh, and then of course, you know, make sure you get an auditor, make sure you get a good auditor. Um, if you want opinions on which auditors to contract, of course, I recommend anyone who's presenting here, uh, but also you can uh, contact Immunify and we can put you in touch with an auditor that we recommend. And then of course, you want more than one audit and if, if you're going to be deploying new code, you want the new code to be audited and then of course, periodically, you probably want to go back over your entire protocol and get a whole ecosystem audit. Uh, particularly as new vulnerabilities surface, as new uh, EVM hard forks are added, um, you know, for instance, EIP 3074, uh, is going to break some contracts, so when that goes in, um, you know, you're going to want to think about how that broke, uh, or how that might negatively affect your contract. Okay, thanks a lot, Duncan. Um, one thing that you said was kind of it was kind of interesting. Um, so you said that all the you know the uh, common uh, vulnerabilities and common attacks that Nico listed that you all de dealt with them in the last week. That was a pretty busy week. I mean, <laughs> You get it. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I. You know. The. Um, it was a bit of a busier week for us, but I. I, I would say that in your average two weeks, we would see uh, all of those. So you know, oh. there. The, it is those vulnerabilities are real. We do see them in the wild, um, and mitigating them uh, is sometimes more difficult and uh, more fraught than we would like. Um, oh. So, you know, definitely make sure that you are uh, having DeFi best practices. Um, you know, all of the things that I just talked about, you know, development practices, auditing, um, those are your, you know, first and second line of defense. Your last line of defense is a bug bounty. You always want to make sure that your bug bounty is posted, it's public, um, and that it's big, right? Uh, one of the things about bug bounties is um, to test a black hat, a bug bounty is going to need to be a very large percentage of uh, what they could steal. 
but it might not be as large as you could, as you think. Um, in our case, we've found that 10% is really the number where black hats start to think about turning white. And I can say with confidence that the Immunify uh, community does consist of some black hat hackers who have decided that bug bounties in DeFi make sense and that they would rather report bugs than exploit them. Because, you know, yes, they're missing out on 90% of that hack, but that 10%, that's clean money. You know, they could take that, pay taxes on it, buy a house, you know, retire to the Bahamas, you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, so make sure you have a bug bounty. That is your last line of defense. That is what turns black hats white. Yeah, and definitely because if they choose to stay black hats, then they're going to try, you know, they're going to have to try to hide the funds. And our next speaker is trying to avoid that, actually. Our next speaker is Patrick Drummond, investigator at Chainalysis. And he's going to tell us, you know, how he tracks the funds after. So, for example, we had this example in Duncan. That was such a great example of... Uh, this uh, NFT ransom. I mean, I didn't know you could do that. That is so that is so interesting to see. Um, what if you know the hacker takes the money and tries to get away with it? How can we stop him? And Patrick is going to explain how he does it. Thanks a lot, Duncan. Patrick, the floor is yours. Awesome. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Patrick, and I'm an investigator uh, working at Chainalysis. Uh, I went down the DeFi rabbit hole uh, several years ago, and I've been constantly researching uh, the space ever since. At Chainalysis, I'm part of an extremely talented team of investigators. I've learned like, so much from them, and I just want to thank them for all they do across the globe to help make uh, the cryptocurrency space uh, safer for everyone. And today, I will give a glimpse of an investigation, specifically uh, a DeFi exploit. Uh, I'm going to walk through a uh, Pickle Finance exploit and go through the process of how to begin a DeFi investigation and then trace the stolen funds. This is a, a really interesting case, and I am very excited to share some of the findings. And just a brief overview with uh, PickleFi. Uh, it was a, a forked version of Yearn uh, where users can deposit crypto into vaults, or they call it jars, which automatically find the best yield. The jars are controlled by a controller contract, which enable direct swaps between the jars. And an attacker created a malicious kind of copycat contract they named it the evil jar. They then swapped funds between the evil jar and the real jar that had users' deposits. And they made away with about $19.7 million, all in the stablecoin DAI. So let's start at just uh, beginning a DeFi investigation. Uh, I first like to just focus on ETH. With some of these exploits, there are literally dozens and dozens of ERC-20 tokens that are you know, stolen. Uh, however, you know, the common theme with all of those is that the addresses, they need ETH right, to transfer those tokens and pay for gas fees. So I look at where did they get their kind of initial ETH from? And I also look at what other addresses did they send ETH to? And the sending part is important because you know, after an attack, the hacker's address is public. And a lot of times people will kind of dust that address or send some ERC-20 tokens to like kind of promote their own token uh, to the hacker's address. But when I'm looking at sending activity, I know that you know, the hacker, they're the ones actually you know, initiating that transfer out. And it gives me much more confidence that they actually control those ETH addresses that they're sending ETH to. Uh, however, I have found uh, in pretty much every DeFi exploit I've looked into that people try to communicate 
with the hacker by sending very, very small amounts of ETH to their address. And in that transaction, they send uh, a, like a text message. And I've actually found some pretty interesting and funny ones. Uh, this was a message sent from kind of a random address to a pretty prominent DeFi uh, hacker. And it's this uh, quote from the movie Taken. So I like to think that maybe you know Liam Neeson is actually a, a crypto investigator in his free time. And I've also found really helpful messages. Uh, there's this one address out there that comes up in every kind of exploit. And what they do is they actually investigate the, the exploit on their own. Uh, they trace where the funds are. They then write up an investigation report. They put it in a pastebin link. And then they send this link in a transaction to the hacker's address. Uh, so I find this so interesting about you know, the DeFi community, how you know we're all working on this together, and there are many people out there, you know, helping everyone out by tracing the flow of funds and writing their findings and report, uh, which does help me with my own investigation. So now to get into the initial stages of the PickleFi exploit. This was the, the contract that was used to you know, exploit PickleFi. This was the address that was used to create the contract. And it was also the address that sent the transaction to execute the exploit. And if you look at the you know, specific transaction that you know, drained the, the pickle jar, you find that it costs three ETH. Uh, it costs the hacker, you know, three ETH to execute this transaction, and you know that tells me that they had to get this three ETH right before the the attack. Uh, so that's where I initially start to see, all right, where did they source this ETH that was used to you know, initiate and exploit uh, the protocol? And in this case. Um, they got the ETH from Tornado Cash, which is a, probably the most popular uh, Ethereum mixer. Uh, so the hack occurred on November 21st at like 1835. Uh, so about you know, 14 minutes before the hack, uh, the attacker withdrew 10 ETH from Tornado Cash. And this was the ETH that was used to pay for gas fees. All right, and this graph is showing the, the initial die movement. Uh, so this purple line here, this was the 19.7 million die that was taken from the PickleFi contract to an address that the hacker controls. Again, this occurred November 21st, 2020. And uh, the die actually sat um, idle at this address for several months. And then on January 7th, 2021, uh, the hacker started to move the funds. And that's where you're seeing with these green lines here. Uh, they completely emptied out the 19.7 million die sitting at this address, and they sent it to four new addresses. And now I'm going to talk about some of the DeFi protocols that these uh, stolen die has uh, interacted with. And one pattern I'm seeing in, in some of these cases is that there's no huge rush to move these funds off chain. And why is that? Well, you know, it's the same characteristics that draw us towards DeFi that can also be very attractive uh, to hackers, such as you know, it's permissionless, a big you know, lack of KYC, and as we'll see with this specific exploit, uh, the potential to earn yields on your kind of idle crypto. Now, this can be kind of frustrating as an investigator uh, because you cannot really stop these transactions from happening. You know, that's just like the nature of the blockchain. Uh, there have been times with this specific exploit where I'd be 
looking at the hacker's address on Etherscan, and I would see, you know, pending transactions. Uh, so in real time, you know, they're moving the the die around, depositing it in some protocols, and I can only really just kind of watch it and see where it goes. But on the other hand, this is also very useful for investigators because every action it's still occurring on chain and in that case it's traceable uh, specifically with like exchanges um you know with a centralized exchange if you see stolen funds being sent there uh, you don't know right away what they're doing with those funds you have to reach out to the exchange you know they know internally what's going on uh, but there's a little time delay with that but you know, when you see funds going to Uniswap, you can see in real time, all right, what are they swapping the DAI into? And here on the right is just a list of all of the different DeFi protocols uh, that the Pickle Finance hacker used. All right, and I don't have time to go over every single protocol, but I wanted to go over some of the most uh, important ones, starting with decentralized exchanges, uh, specifically you know, Uniswap and OneInch, which is an aggregator. But you know, these two show up uh, in many, many different exploits because they're kind of the most used uh, DeFi applications out there. So what you're seeing here, you know, these are the original kind of transfers the green lines to the four new addresses. And then these blue lines is the hacker sending the die to one inch and Uniswap. And they swapped uh, the die into ETH, ZRX, and Uni, uh, but the vast majority was to ETH. So I'm gonna show you how you can kind of trace through these uh, decentralized exchanges and to continue following the flow of funds. All right, so now we're looking at ETH. So these values are ETH and you know, the same addresses that we're sending the DAI into these DEXs are the ones receiving and swapping into ETH. One kind of interesting thing is that initially, you know, these three addresses, they're brand new and they had no ETH on it. So you know, how could they actually pay for these fees to perform these swaps? Well, right before these swaps, uh, the hacker withdrew one ETH from Tornado Cash to this 157 address. So then this 157 address, they have enough ETH to pay for gas fees. So they initiate these two transactions to swap the die into more ETH. And you're seeing that here, they're getting ETH for those swaps. And then they send the ETH to the 64B address and 607D address. We see here, so now the 64B address and the 607D address, they have ETH now, they can transfer the die that you're seeing here. And they can also pay for those kind of pricey transaction fees uh, to swap the DAI into even more ETH. And that's what you're seeing here. And then finally, the ETH is sent back to Tornado Cash. And now I'm gonna talk about how the hacker used DeFi to earn interest on the funds. So, you know, 6 million DAI uh, was swapped to ETH, but 19.7 you know, million was drained. So, you know, what happened to the remaining funds? Well, as we see here with this transaction, uh, the hacker essentially put the DAI to work. Uh, they deposited 13 million DAI into compound uh, for interest. And this is also you know, very kind of DeFi specific. 
Um, just because you know, Compound, it's permissionless, there's no KYC. Obviously, the, the hacker felt comfortable enough to deposit the funds from this very you know, public exploit uh, into Compound to get um, you know, maybe 4 to 8% interest on that die. Uh, now I'm going to talk about probably one of the most interesting things I've seen uh, in a DeFi investigation. Um, that, that the hacker actually used this 13 million die as collateral to take out a loan on Compound. And I'll kind of walk through what we're seeing on the blockchain. So this 3000 uh, ETH kind of transaction, this green line here, uh, this is the hacker borrowing 3000 ETH from Compound. And then right after that, they deposited that 3,000 ETH plus another 500 ETH that they got from one inch to Alpha Finance. Now, why are they doing this? They're doing a little bit of yield arbitrage here. You know, they're paying about 3% interest uh, to Compound for this loan, and they're depositing it to Alpha Finance, uh, where they're getting about 6% interest on this ETH. And I did some math here. Uh, this initial loan took place in late January. ETH was around a thousand bucks at that time. So 3,000 ETH was $3.3 million on the day of the loan. And they have you know, that $13 million worth of DAI as collateral. And they have a very healthy you know, loan to collateral ratio of 25%. But then over the next several months, ETH really went on a run and basically tripled in value. So in late April, 3,000 ETH was worth $9 million. They still only have $13 million as collateral. So their, their ratio jumped to 70%. And Compound has a max loan to collateral ratio of 75 before liquidation. So you can actually see on the blockchain that uh, the hacker closed out their deposit here. So they withdrew 3,602 ETH, and then they deposited back uh, to Compound to pay off their loan because they almost got liquidated. Uh, and we can see here they deposited 3,500. Uh, they withdrew 3,602. So they made about 102 ETH profit from Alpha Finance. And then with Compound, with the loan, they borrowed 3,000. Looks like they paid about 34 ETH in interest. Uh, so they still made about a 68 ETH profit. And I think this may be maybe the first instance of you know, stolen funds being used uh, to, as collateral to perform yield arbitrage. And in this case, we also saw kind of another theme of DeFi, which is money is elastic. And generally, you know, crypto will be deposited to wherever the highest yield is. And in late April, Aave, which is a, a competitor to Compound, uh, they launched a liquidity mining program that gives users extra rewards uh, for lending, lending and borrowing on the Aave protocol. This rewards program was executed on April 26th and started making the news on April 27th. And what did our hacker do? Well, on April 29th, they withdrew their DAI from Compound. And then 20 minutes later, they deposited that same chunk of DAI to Aave. And you know, Aave, it gives you extra rewards for depositing on their platform, but also for borrowing and taking out loans. So what did our hacker do? Well, they used this 11.4 million die as collateral, and they borrowed 8.5 million die. But they didn't stop there. They then took this borrowed 8.5 million die, they deposited that back to Aave, 
they use this as collateral to take out a 6.7, uh, 3 million die loan. And then they repeated, and then they repeated that again. So they really only have this 11.4 million die. They did kind of fractional reversing uh, more and more loans. And they're doing this to take advantage of Aave's rewards program because the more die that they deposit and borrow, uh, the more rewards they will get. And I think this is a great example that also shows how you know, DeFi savvy this hacker really is. So uh, the remaining funds now, the majority of the die is still in Aave. Uh, the rewards program goes to July 15th. So I'm curious to see if they kind of switch their strategy once they're not getting any extra rewards. But due to some extremely leveraged borrowing, they have 27.7 million die deposited and they have 20.8 million die borrowed. And in the span of two months, they've already uh, achieved over $100,000 profit um, of rewards. Additionally, they have uh, 4 million die in Alchemex, and with that, they borrowed another 1.8 million Alchemex USD, and then they have some remaining tokens still in Compound. So, despite all this kind of on chain activity, uh, it can still be difficult to find leads solely looking at the hackers' addresses, uh, mainly because of the lack of KYC. However, this is how I kind of go about these cases and try to find leads. It's very probable that the hackers are advanced DeFi users. And because of that, they have to have you know, a personal ETH address that they use for their DeFi activity. Now, their personal address is not going to be directly connected to any of the stolen fund addresses. However, if you are able to find their personal address, that may have some very solid leads. So you know, somewhere on the blockchain is the hacker's you know, personal ETH address, and that is what I try to uncover. And in conclusion, um, after talking about all these DeFi exploits, uh, I think it's still important to um, let everyone know that majority of DeFi activity is not illicit. And that in 2020, we found that just 0.05% of all funds received by DeFi platforms came from addresses associated with criminal activity. Despite that, you know, this still is a very big problem. And you know, everyone here wants to protect DeFi users and see the industry grow. And I think you know, one way to accomplish that is by you know, interacting and working together with the amazing community around DeFi. As we've seen today, there are smart contract auditors and white hat hackers who are identifying vulnerabilities. And then there's you know, blockchain investigators tracing the funds and raising awareness to their final destination. And I think you know, together we can help make the DeFi space uh, much safer. And with that being said, you know, if you found this presentation uh, interesting, and you want to talk more about DeFi investigating, please feel free to reach out via my email address. And I just want to thank everyone for, for watching. And I'll hand this over to Emily for some, uh, some closing thoughts for this panel. Thank you so much. That was crazy interesting. I can't believe that, you know, they have the guts to do that. I mean, this is crazy that to steal so much money. I mean, not steal, exploit so much money, and then, you know, 
keep you know keep uh, basically investing it at you know where everybody can see that is just you know mind mind boggling to me thanks a lot um so we had one question uh give me a second so basically they were asking um how uh, it was possible for for the for the hacker to um, uh, transfer the funds from the normal jars to the evil jars. I don't have the question in front of me, uh, I'm sorry, but that was basically the mm -hmm. question to re-explain how it worked in kind of a simple way. Uh, oh yeah, I have it in front of me, sorry about that. Um, so could you give a simple explanation of how the PickleFi hacker was able to swap funds from the legitimate jar into the evil jar? Uh -huh. Well, uh, to be honest, I'm not, as knowledgeable in the the specifics, I think maybe, maybe Nico or Duncan um, will know much more than I do about that. Uh, yeah, but Nico or Duncan, there yeah. has been a, a really good write up. Um, I can send this link maybe in the chat, and it, it it goes over the the technical aspects of this hack. Great, thank you. Yeah, it would be great if you post it in the chat. In the meantime, I don't know, Nico or Duncan, if you, if you know a bit about this attack and you want to uh, kind of explain or, or maybe you're not familiar with it yet. Uh, I don't know, Duncan, if you can like ad hoc explain. I just wanted to offer to also send, I think, a similar link. I have a big list where I have uh, hacks, the DeFi hacks, and then explanations and all that. And um, I can just pull up my list, uh, list and uh -huh. see if I find some more links on that, um, else I would hand over to Duncan. Uh, so I don't know off the top of my head, but give me five minutes. <laughs> okay, sure. So we have a very funny comment over here. You're going to turn us into hackers, but no, you know, you we have to become white hat hackers, you know, and then you can actually use the funds. I mean, th this is what we've been taught, right? Because, I mean, this guy there, and you know, I, I say guy, maybe it's a girl, this girl there, um, you know, they're, they're making money, but they haven't been able to to use it for themselves and to take it out, you know. So let, let's see. And I'm sure that you know Patrick is going to catch her or him when when they do. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, the, this is actually a, a pretty pretty quick one. Uh, it's just insufficient validation. Um, there was no check that the uh, recipient jar was actually deployed by Pickle, and so as long as you implemented the jar. Um, ABI, then it would just send you money. Perfect, thank you. There's also, I, I pulled up my, my spreadsheet with all the hacks and the explanations and I saw I have the same source. I have one other source describing it and I also paste it in. Um, I hope these are the right transaction because it's a little bit messy. Um, links for, for Etherscan. Okay, thanks. I have a great question here. Why wouldn't the hacker directly put and and I guess now this is questions from for all the panelists, right? So just you know, if you want to answer, just just go. So why wouldn't the hacker directly put the fund in a mixer? And can you trace through a mixer? So Patrick, you were talking about tornado okay. cash. Can you trace through 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 something like that or? Yeah, I I can't speak um, to. Uh, like specifics, uh, but you know, kind of a background. You know, mixers they they break the link of deposits and withdrawals. Uh, so some some other address, you know, deposited one ETH to Tornado, um, and a different address withdrew it. And you see with these deposits, right? These two addresses are depositing ETH to Tornado, and another address is you know kind of withdrawing it and there's no like direct link uh what i can say is that you know mixers it still is all on chain uh, so you can try to look at you know withdrawals maybe match up deposits withdrawals uh, but there's no no direct link to that and that's a good question about the you know why didn't they just convert everything to eth and then put it through Tornado. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think maybe they, they just wanted to keep some in the DeFi protocols. They're definitely very advanced users. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll have to see. 
what happens to the, the remaining dye. But if it yeah, comes so the, the, answer, the issue with mixers, right, it's always about the size of the anonymity set relative to the size of the asset that you're moving. Um, you know, the longer you uh, keep your asset in the mixer, the bigger your anonymity set. Um, if you're trying to launder a really huge amount of asset, like uh, what we see here from Pickle, um, you would have to deposit it and leave it there for a really long time and withdraw it only piecemeal over time um, if you wanted to actually, you know, retain the anonymity guarantees of a mixer like that. Uh, you know, as far as the technical soundness of a mixer like Tornado Cash, um, uh, Tornado Cash is very well designed, um, but it's all about exactly how you use it. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, guys, if you have more questions, feel free to shoot. I mean, we're, we're happy to take questions or even if you just have comments and you want to, you know, participate in the discussion, we're very happy to, to discuss with you. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, if we are, if there are no more questions, uh, I guess we can, uh, we could close the event. Unless uh, there is, there are some some closing remarks that, that anybody wants to make, yeah. any of the speakers? Okay. I think it was really interesting. Thank you very much. This was amazing. This was pretty cool, in my opinion. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you, Nico. Th thanks a lot for your insight. So we have some comments uh, that it was a great talk. Thank you very much, guys, for for supporting us. Um, you know, so. Just to close, I want to say again a big, big thank you to the presenters. Uh, so to Nico, to Duncan, to Patrick, but also to Chainalysis, to Molly, who really supported us to organize this event, to put this together. Um, this is this has been recorded. So if you want to, you know, go back through it or share it with your friends, uh, feel free to do so. Um, so it's going to be on YouTube. I'm going to post it soon. Uh, some other comments that it was very interesting. Thank you so much, guys, and we hope to see you soon at further events. Bye. Amazing. Thank you.